The Secrets of Doctor Who is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, episode 168. One day, I shall come back. That's it. I've been renewed. As when a Time Lord's body wears out, he regenerates. I'm a Time Lord. I'm not a human being. I walk in eternity. Brave heart, team. Change, my dear. And it seems on a moment too soon. Unlimited vice pudding! Position helpless. Wearing a bit thin. Fantastic. Hello, Z! I am Scottish. I can complain about things. She'll be fine. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we discuss everything about the hit BBC series, Doctor Who. And today we're discussing the fifth Doctor story, Black Orchid. Joining me today on the panel are Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. And Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going? Very well, thank you. Uh, Folks, if you can do us a huge favor, uh, you know, I know we ask (laughs) you guys to to do a few things uh, every once in a while, is if you could, if you haven't yet late, lately even, written a review of the podcast at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from, we would greatly appreciate it. The reviews, in fact, you, you can actually write new reviews, even if you've written one before, but reviews help the uh, people discover the podcasts. And so as we're coming off of a, a season of Doctor Who, uh, a, you know, a new season that we just finished, we can, uh, you know, reach people who have picked up on Doctor Who and started watching and are looking for discussions of previous seasons of Doctor Who that we that we continue to do now. And uh, so that if you could write a review, that would greatly help those people find this podcast and maybe they'd enjoy this too. So we would really appreciate that. And if you could share the podcast with your friends who have discovered Doctor Who and, and let them know, hey, here's a podcast that talks about it that you might be interested in. So we would really appreciate that. All right, so we're talking about Black Orchid, which is a, as I said, a fifth Doctor story. It is a two-part episode, which was unusual for this time period, uh, which aired in March of 1982. In fact, it aired back-to-back, March 1st and 2nd, 1982. So that's uh, interesting. Yeah, and when we say two-part, this is in the days when they were like 25 minutes long, so the whole story is less than an hour. Yes, yes. I mean, this 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 whole story would fit in a modern Who episode very easily. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. It would be. It's it 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 goes up. It, you know, it's two twenty five minute episodes, so it's very uh, short story. Uh, it's includes his companions Adric, Nissa, and Tegan, who are still traveling with him, mm-hmm. and it is the last of the true historicals, which is uh, to yes. mean that it's the the last time we have a a Doctor Who story that without in the past without some science fiction element to yeah. it. Yeah. Other other than the TARDIS and the time travelers themselves. Right. Yeah. Yes. Right. And and I frankly like these. I wish they would bring this genre back. I mean, I know it should be here. every other week, <laughs> but Yeah. But it's like, come on, we need to go to the past regularly. And when we go to the past, I'd like it to be something other than an alien invasion every stinking time. Yeah. Right, right. Or some and kind of alien intervention, yeah. Yeah. And we did get close with the 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 first season of, of the Thirteenth uh, Doctor, Thirteenth yeah. Doctor, but still there was the, the alien aspect they had to throw in there. So right. almost uh, how close did we get? I mean, in Rosa, we've got an alien racist from the future. In Demons yeah. of the Punjab, we've got alien stuff, and in the King James episode, we have sort of we have these alien tree people things. Well, Ro- Rosa was Rosa was probably the closest because they could have just made him a, t- a, a racist of the time instead of a alien racist from the future, but. Right. They, Anyways. It wouldn't have been hard to make those stories. Like, Demons of the Punjab, it wouldn't have been hard even to make that a, a non-alien story. Uh, you, that I think that's where you, when, you mean, when you mean close, yeah. Because I, 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 like, mm-hmm. the ones we've talked about with the Highlanders or the um, Reign of Terror, those are Aztecs. Inter- yeah. Yeah, the Aztecs, interesting explorations of the culture and history of a, t- of a time mm-hmm. that, that really are at the heart of... One of the reasons that Doctor Who was started in the first place was both to mm-hmm. explore science, but also to explore history 
for kids. And I think that would that would be fun. I think that would be interesting. Yeah. Now, now, perhaps this is the point that we throw in the disclaimer, though. We are recording this before the new season, the, the right. second That's season true. of number 13 comes out. Yeah. So it's possible that what we're talking about right now has already been answered. That would not be... likely, however. That's not <laughs> yeah. the trend of New Who, but let's just throw that disclaimer out there so people realize yes. we don't know if there's a historical in the second season of Jody Whitaker. So that's right. Before we get into the meat of this episode, I just wanted to say that on balance, I like this episode and mm -hmm. it has one of my favorite moments in Doctor Who history of all time in it, <laughs> which I look forward to talking about when we get to it. Okay, um, stay tuned. <laughs> also, there is a um, this is kind of like Doctor Who visits another. He, he's not just traveling in time. He's traveling in genre. And this is like visit yeah. to a different genre because this is this is a cozy mystery. You know, this is yes. like something mm -hmm. Agatha Christie or Dorothy Sayers would write. You know, it's a, mi a murder mystery set at a manor house. It even has the crazy secret, not actually dead after all relative being hidden <laughs> in the house, just like in Jane Eyre. Mm -hmm. Right. And I like it, frankly. I mean, I can think of another time when Doctor Who did something like this. It, and we talked about it recently, the unicorn and the wasp. And I like this right. better than the Unicorn and the Wasp. I mean, I recognize yeah. the Unicorn and the Wasp has slicker production values, but uh, this is just more enjoyable. It's more true to the mm -hmm. to this to the genre of the cozy mystery. Yeah, this is uh, takes place in the Edwardian era, which if uh, so, Downton Abbey times. Uh, for those mm -hmm. of you who watch Downton Abbey, uh, nineteen twenty five specifically couple other points about this. I, I enjoy this, too. This was apparently the highest rated story of the Fifth Doctor era, which is interesting. Wow. Uh, hmm. uh, but given, given all of the really good stories that, that, there, that have been made. But this was the uh, highest rated. I'm thinking there was something specific about this March 1st, March 2nd airing of it, of the time. I didn't see anything that explained why they aired on two consecutive days. And maybe there was a Maybe there was some reason that some event that got people to to watch it uh, more than the others. They were airing twice a week at this point. Okay, so, so they, oh, okay. and if something bumped one of them, one of them by a day, that could have put it back right. to back. Okay. Uh, the the other uh, point is it, this is also the first two parter of the eighties. Uh, so this was mm -hmm. nineteen eighty two, and uh, another bit of uh, trivia. It was the first two-parters since the Sontaran experiment, which we talked about recently. So uh, two-parters were not common at this time. All right, so let's talk about the episode itself. It starts with a servant in a white coat being strangled in a, in a corner of a, of a manor house or some sort of home. And, uh, I, while, I, and I wonder yeah. if this is like partly a statement about British class structure, because the servant never gets a name. And, oh, he does. Well, I mean, for, uh, at this correct point, yeah. at, at at the yeah. end, he gets a name, right. um, but uh, but for most of the episode, he doesn't have a name. Even when the doctor later finds his body and shows it to uh, to Lady Cranley, it's like, oh, he's one of the servants. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. right. It's like, okay, he's just to help. He's also a yeah. human being. <laughs> yes, yes, the, 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 the remarkably un, unfazed by it. Uh, but we have a series of li of these little vignettes before the the opening credits here, or in the in the tease, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. where we get these vignettes, and so we have the servant being strangled. Then we see a young woman who looks remarkably like Nyssa sleeping, and then we see someone has been tied up in a bed, uh, while an Amazonian Indian Indian with a stretched lower lip uh, lip, sits lip, reading a book. Lip, lip plate. A lip plate. Yep. Uh, he, he's sitting nearby reading a book. By the way, and it's this bizarre juxtaposition of these things. Yeah. By the way, I I like the how they they don't make a big deal. I mean, they they touch on it later a couple of times where the doctor's trying to describe the South American guy, and he says he has a lip, but he doesn't know what to call it. Yeah. Um, but that's really late, and it's just like a, mentioned in one scene. I like how they make no big deal for most of this. No big deal out of this guy's lip plate. It's just part of his culture. We're letting him get right. on with it. No big deal. So then uh, post uh, opening, we, we have the TARDIS arriving uh, at Cranley Halt, a, ra a railway station. Uh, it says, I like that. That's such a, a great uh, yeah. English name, Cranley yeah. Halt. Because uh, it's where the, the rail line halts. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. and then the doctor asks the, the TARDIS after they land, why the fascination for Earth's history? 
why do you keep coming back to this this the, uh, Earth's history of these time periods? So he's sort of uh, they were uh, they were trying to go somewhere else, and um, they they Portigan thought Portigan thought he was going to get rid rid of her again or yes. try to get rid of her again, and yeah, she's finally settled on. Oh, I, I'd like to actually stay traveling with you. Uh, she's not so set on getting back to Heathrow uh, like she was, uh, mm-hmm. but uh, the the doctor says that uh, as a boy. They come out and they see the railway station, and they they he explains what a rail what a train is to uh, Nissa and Adric, and he says that as a boy he always wanted to drive a train engine. And I'm thinking they have trains on Gallifrey. I mean, how does how, like why? Well, he probably probably knew about it from like you know Earth history class or something they took. But but like, I didn't realize would, the doctor was a train buff. I li- yeah. I like him more because of that. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. Why would Time Lords be studying Earth history like this minor? backwater well, planet <laughs> he had to hear about earth somewhere and he's clearly obsessed with earth so mm-hmm. that's true that's true well maybe his- but then again he is a time lord so what does being a time lord kid look like i mean william <laughs> hartnell could be considered the time lord kid your first regeneration could be you know where you're no longer a kid that's true that's true he was he could have been considered, <laughs> for, by this point you could have been relatively a boy uh so then and then they as they come around the train station there's a driver standing there who appa- you know who apparently is waiting for them uh he says the doctor is expected yeah and this is something that is i had to go back and rewatch this because it's rather confusing and i think it's a flaw in the writing mm-hmm. the, you know the chauffeur is just expecting the doctor for some reason and right what actually is the case is so he's he's the chauffeur of lord cranley right. and mm-hmm. and lord cranley is a younger guy and he is he still is in touch with his schoolmates and one of yep. his schoolmates is a guy that we later n- learn is named Smutty this is a pg woodhouse style school nickname there are lots of nicknames mm-hmm. like this in pg woodhouse you have G- in jeeves and worcester worcester's schoolmates have nicknames like biffy beefy chuffy corky gussy barmy tucky <laughs> stiffy and stinker and so <laughs> smutty is just a part of that uh, and and it doesn't mean what you might think it means in contemporary right. american english a piece of smut originally was a piece of soot or dirt That's so it's one. like this is a sooty guy he, maybe he didn't wash behind his ears one day or something it's kind of like kind of like the uh the character Pigpen from Peanuts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, he would be smutty. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, uh, one of Lord Cranley's schoolmates was this guy Smutty, who we never see, although he does talk to Lord Cranley on the telephone. And Smutty knew Lord Cranley is having a big cricket match at his estate, but he also knows he needs help in that cricket match. So he was planning to send a friend of his apparently called the doctor maybe that's his nickname or maybe he's doctor something or other he's a doctor a doctor yeah. kind of took it as yeah he's, he's sending a friend who's a doctor on the train to participate in the cricket match but the train always runs late and the tardis got there first and later we're going to find out actually the doctor that smutty sent never actually departed it seems right yep. but that's why the chauffeur is expecting the doctor because it's he's expecting this other doctor. Yep. Well, and the added problem of the fact the, the fact that the doctor, the fifth doctor, always wears a cricket outfit. He's well, wearing he, a cricket yes. outfit. He, sort of. Yeah. I've done yeah, some research of. into this. I was once listening to a big finish play, and I think it was uh Jeffrey Beaver's master was talking to the fifth doctor about this and pointed out you dress like like no one in the history of cricket ever and <laughs> and that kind of twigged me to okay he's he's meant to be cricket like but it's not a straight cricket costume so i did some research and it seems that the main thing that says cricket to people about it is the sweater he wears right. that's called a cricket Correct. jumper but cricketers don't typically wear the hat that the doctor does or the long co- obviously not the celery or the long coat that he wears, Mm -hmm. and they tend to wear just white pants, not the striped pants. Uh, They do wear athletic shoes, which the doctor does, but it seems that basically it's the sweater and the shoes that are the only things that really say cricket about this outfit, and everything else is kind of a modification. But because part of it says cricket, the chauffeur thinks, oh, this is the cricketer I've been waiting for. Right. Right. 
Yeah, I, I suppose it would be as if someone was expecting someone to come play in a you know like a family baseball game or a softball game, and the guy gets off the train wearing a baseball jersey and baseball cleats. Yeah, and, but has right. jeans on or whatever. You know, yeah, I can see the 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 uh, confusion. So they they the driver takes them to the cricket match. Uh, although the the driver um, is sort of stares at Nissa a bit. Uh, we'll find out later that uh, Nissa looks exactly like. Cranley's fiance. In fact, it's played by the same actress, of course. Genetic and, spatial uh, multiplicity. <laughs> right. Exactly. On display in the episode itself. Uh and then uh they 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 show up at the at the match. Uh the doctor is incorporated into the game right away. And apparently the doctor is really good <laughs> at cricket. Yeah. <laughs> Although I, I will say I, I am like uh, Adric and Nissa. I love yeah. baseball. I don't understand a single rule of cricket. I was All I know is it's got that. a ball, a bat, and you try to hit the ball with the bat. I yeah. Don't, yeah. yeah, I was going to say, I have no idea how the game of cricket is played, so, so that entire scene was lost on me. <laughs> well, and I like how Tegan is sitting there getting into it, watching the game, and Adric and Nissa are just, what the heck going on here? <laughs> right, <laughs> but right. the doctor, and by the way, Peter Davison is, a, is apparently a real cricket fan. It was his idea yes. to wear the cricket jumper. Yeah, mm. and he's apparently pretty good at it. <laughs> that that uh -huh. was him doing the real bowling uh, right. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And so he's apparently a good cricket player, and as the doctor, he's an awesome cricket player. And this reminded me of the scene in Matt Smith's time in The Lodger, where the doctor like yeah. tries his hand at, I, I forget if it's rugby or soccer, but... Soccer, know, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. and football. And, um, and he just, you know, cleans up. On on the field, and this is the right. cricket equivalent of that. That's true. That's right. I forgot about that one. Yeah, <laughs> the doctor's apparently quite athletic. Uh, so at the end of the match, uh, the, when when he's won for for Lord Cranley's team, the uh, the doctor's introduced to Cranley's mother as the doctor, and she says, "Doctor Who." Yeah, <laughs> so we have, of we have course. Have Traveling incognito. And, yes. Oh, oh! That, I bet that's part of why we never get the name of the other doctor. It's because he's traveling incognito. Oh, so, like, yep, maybe, maybe he's meant to. Yep, yep. Maybe Smutty has sent a ringer who's like a professional cricketer or something. Right, yeah. he's a doctor of yeah. cricket. Yeah, and this okay. leads us to one of my most favorite of all time <laughs> moments in Doctor Who history. Yes, because in, in addition to meeting Lady Cranley, who's Lord Cranley's mother. Because Lord Cranley is engaged, he's about to be married, but his mother is still Lady Cranley. In addition to her, there's this guy named Sir Robert, who's like the chief constable of the county. He's some kind of mm -hmm. police official. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he's also obviously a, got a K because he's Sir Robert. And he talks to the doctor about how well the game went. And he says, superb innings, worthy of the master. And, <laughs> and the doctor like gets this frozen look on his face. And says the master. And <laughs> at this point in Doctor Who history, the master has been the villain in three of the last six stories. So yeah, half right. of the recent stories. And he's coming back in two stories. So the, this was a heavy, heavy master centric phase of Doctor Who history. And so <laughs> it's natural for the doctor to blanch at the thought of superb innings worthy of the master. It's like, whose influence are these people under? And, yeah. And then the doctor, so the doctor says, the master. And to clarify, Sir Robert says, the other doctor. <laughs> and it's like, he's another doctor? He's another Time Lord? <laughs> Wait a second, yeah. And then he, and then he clarifies, W.G. Grace. And the, suddenly the doctor is so relieved because W.G. Grace, or William Gilbert Grace, was one of the most famous cricketers of all time. He was born in 1848. He died in 1915, so 10 years before this episode is set. His death was is said to have shaken British society the way Winston Churchill's did. That's how popular he was. This was a major figure in the game and its popularization. And because he got a medical degree, he was called the doctor. And oh. so uh, when you have our doctor passing as the cricketer doctor, it makes all the sense in the world for Sir Robert to say, oh, superb innings, worthy of the master in the lowercase master sense. Um, <laughs> the other doctor, 
W.G. Gray's. And, <laughs> but I just, I love how that plays out in like three parts where you have the escalating tension on the first two yep. parts. And it make, make for, for the doctor and for the viewing audience, it would mean something completely different. Right. And then wham, you get the relief on the third part. A small thing, but it's one of my most favorite moments. And and now that you explained that, that really kind of, that makes that whole thing about, you know, Smutty supposedly sending, you know, a doctor to play cricket. That kind of right. adds another, you know, layer to that. Of like, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. You know, this doctor was this great cricketer. So let's send some guy who's a great cricketer and call him the doctor and see if they right, catch it. Right, right. But oh. he's traveling incognito, so he's not using his name. Well, let me just say this about W.G. Grace. So he played for 44 seasons. So that's pretty awesome. Wow. Uh, that's that's like Tom Brady's times two. Uh, and he had an epic beard. <laughs> let me just say. <laughs> nice. In fact, Jimmy, you could play him in the movie, I think, actually. There's a, there's a resemblance here. I don't know if he had red hair, but because we only have black and white photos. But uh, it's an epic, epic. So we have uh, so that yeah I agree I I did note that one myself because it was it was it, that was amusing even if I didn't know who W G Grace was so now that I do that's even better uh, then uh, Nissa meets her doppelganger uh, her name is Anne Talbot uh, they and then there's a scene of them ordering drinks like the Lord Cranley offers them refreshment uh, the doctor orders a lemonade and then uh, when Nissa orders a screwdriver which is orange juice and vodka. Tegan orders a screwdriver first, and Nissa, right. not knowing what a screwdriver is, says, "I'll have that too." Yeah. Then they, but the doctor instead substitutes orange, or Lord but, Cranley does. Yeah. The doctor coughs, and yeah. Lord Cranley tells the servant, "I think it would be better for just orange juice for the children." So, is Nissa a child? Like, apparently, she's under twenty-one or whatever. The uh, um, in England, I gather, even today, if you're kind of underage, you can still go into a pub and order a beer or whatever. Yeah. But, and I assume that would have been true here as well, mm -hmm. but since the doctor is clearly the guardian of these young people, if he discreetly coughs when one of them says, I'll have a screwdriver, it makes sense for Sir Robert to downgrade that to just orange juice, leave out the vodka. Okay. You know, I, I, I seem to recall, too, they do kind of play Nyssa as if she's a teenage-ish yeah. age, okay. you know? At least equivalent, of course, being an alien from another planet. It's a whole other story, but... Yeah. Now, really, in this time, a, a, a British parent might not have trouble having, especially yeah. in an upper-class society, you know, letting their children have some exposure to alcohol and get some experience with it before mm -hmm. they're an adult and are totally cut loose. But it's that's the discretion of the parent, and that's the function that the doctor is playing here. He's the guardian. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, I noticed that Anne Talbot, who is the duplicate of Nyssa, so apparently the same age, uh, let's just mm -hmm. assume that she gets a lemonade, too, with the doctor. So, uh, yeah, perhaps. Incidentally, something I've noticed, the BBC seems to not let the doctor drink very often. Right. Mm. This is something that runs across multiple doctors in social settings where alcohol is being served. The doctor will almost always beg off. There are a few exceptions. I think like John Pertwee would accept cognac or something yep, or brandy, but most of the time the doctor doesn't. And this is because of the fact this is a children's show. And mm. so they don't mind showing people drinking, but not the hero, right. because right. the one that the kids are going to most identify with. In fact, the I know from Tom Baker's era forward, the, the actors playing the doctor were required to sign a contract or one of the clauses in their contract said that they couldn't smoke or drink in public hmm. without like it being part of the script or something. So like if we put it in the script, hmm. you can do this, but otherwise don't because you're going to be a role model for kids. And so Tom right. Baker hmm. totally took that on board and smoked and drank to excess in private. <laughs> <laughs> That's just, that seems Tom Baker. They kind of poke at that with uh, Twice Upon a Time, the the uh, first Dr. Uh, Capaldi uh, crossover, where there is a bottle of brandy in the TARDIS, and the first doctor noticed that there was right. one shot missing after how many you know thousands of years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right, right. And then right. it turned out because it was poured out during that episode. Mm. <laughs> That's right. That bottle had not been touched. That is funny. 
So uh, some uh, they they are invited to a ball uh, where and then the uh, Lord oh. Cranley offers them costumes. Yeah. Also, before we move on from that scene, we also meet the literal black orchid that this uh, oh, right. that this episode is named after. They have it in a glass case. It's growing in the um, in the entry area, the main area of the house, mm-hmm. and the and it's a black orchid. It's an orchid, and it's black. And it's a species that was discovered by the brother of Lord Cranley. His older brother. His older brother, who would have been Lord. Right. George Cranley, who is also Anne's former fiancé. Yes. But George Cranley was a botanist who va- who vanished two years ago in the jungle. Tegan and, even recognizes his name. He's, he's right. p- p- possibly quite famous. He's a famous botanist. And at this point, I have in my notes, obvious adventure of the blanched soldier. George is clearly not dead. He's in the attic upstairs. Yes, that's that. Exactly. I knew that from this point, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so apparently, George was this botanist. He went off. He discovered this black orchid. He vanished. And Anne, two years later, has now shifted her affections from George, who she was going to marry, to his younger brother, who she's now going to marry, who's the new lord. Yes, quite convenient, the Anne's shifting of affections. She still gets to be Lady Cranley someday. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I should not cast aspersions on her motivations. <laughs> nope. So they, they are, are invited. So we've established what the Black Orchid is and, and who uh, the growling man tied up in the bed is at this point. I mean, yeah. it's, it was fairly obvious. Uh, they're invited to a masked or, or a costume ball, not necessarily masked, but to a costume ball that they're throwing that very day. Uh, and the... Uh, George, uh, Lord Cranley offers them costumes, and Lady Cranley is surprised. She thought that they were already in costume, which I thought was funny, given the, their outfits. Yeah, um, I, I love I love the line. Tegan says, we don't have any costumes. And Sir Robert says, funny, I was just thinking how charming yours is. Because she's, <laughs> a, a, she's wearing a 1980s stewardess outfit. Right. Yeah, which right. Would, could, would not have existed in 1925. <laughs> right. Uh, and then uh, Anne Talbot gets this idea that she and Nyssa should dress alike at the at the ball, uh, so they have the same costume. Uh, but she she they look she like drops... the bugaloos. Yeah, with the yeah. bug. What are the oh, bugaloos? The bugaloos were was a short run Saturday morning British TV series that I watched obsessively when I was six years old. It was okay. about it was about it was a live action show with people who were insects. So you had like a grasshopper character and a ladybug character and a butterfly character. And Nyssa and um, and uh, uh, Anne. Anne are yeah. both wearing the same kind of blue-purple butterfly costume. Gotcha, gotcha. Without the wings. Yeah, uh, but with the, antenna. The, yeah, we do find out mm. that the only difference between Anne and Nyssa is that Anne has a mole on her shoulder, which I thought would come out later, like we would need to figure out who is who. But yeah. they never actually revisit that. That's very interesting. Nope. Uh, they throw that out there, but don't use that. Uh, so the uh, mystery. So uh, the doctor has a Harlequin uh, costume, which including a mask. Mm-hmm. And we while should, he's going, we, we go should ahead. probably mention what a Harlequin is. Uh, you know, people okay. may have seen them there. They look kind of like clowns, but not exactly. Yeah. Where Harlequin comes from? Harlequin is a stock character from Italian Commedia dell'arte and the harlequin is so in Commedia dell'arte you have these stock characters like the doctor who is always pompous and doesn't know as much as he thinks you know cuz this is comedy right and you have the young lovers and you have you know various other characters including some comedic servants who are known as the zani and Harlequin is one of those. Harlequin is one of the Zani. He's kind of a trickster. He's kind of a comedian. And he's a shrewd servant, like who can either right. advance his master's plans or thwart his master's plans. He's kind of like Jeeves in Jeeves and Worcester, only in a right. Harlequin costume. Okay. Hmm. And it's from the Zani, these comic servants in Commedia dell'arte, that we get the English word Zany. They're the zany oh. ones. Okay. Ah. And so that's where the Harlequin character comes from, if you yeah. have not been familiar with that. And, and traditionally, the Harlequin costume had a pattern of checks, of a diamond-checked yeah. uh, pattern on the outfit, which is where we get, like, Harlequin ice cream and Harlequin cookies 
that have that pattern. So the pattern has taken on the name from the 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 uh, the, the costume. Mm -hmm. Well, in any case, uh, uh, nothing the, to do with Harleen Quiznell. No. <laughs> so the uh, mystery man comes out of a secret passageway in the doctor's room while the doctor's in taking a bath. Singing, takes, singing, si yes. as, as he's drawing the bath, like it reminded me of that scene with John Pertwee in the shower singing. Yes, yeah. yeah, so the doctor likes to sing as he bathes, and he takes the doctor's <laughs> costume, uh, and and then uh, this, comes out of the secret corridor to take the costume. Right, and the doctor comes out and uh, sees gets the, locked the, in the secret guy <laughs> in the secret corridor. Yeah, in, in his bathrobe, just uh, the doctor standing there in just his yeah. robe, apparently. Uh, and he's he's locked in, and he, and he says, "Oh darn my, you know, curious nature, or whatever." Mm -hmm. but, he says, by by the lines. way, they mentioned later that the the secret corridors. I thought they were like servants' corridors, but they're actually they were actually priest holes. Yes. Yeah, which, I was going to uh, bring that up. Which, by the way, if we ever have persecution in the United States, I want someone who has a house like that. That is a really <laughs> comfortable looking priest hole. So, well, we, so let's talk about that a second. That that yeah. uh, apparently the Cranleys must have been Catholic, right? Historically, right. Uh, and a priest hole. Was a a place for in the in the time when when Catholics were persecuted and, and Catholicism was outlawed, priests who were uh, who were uh, facing death if caught, uh, right. pre being priests. So in public. to to be to be a, a Catholic was illegal in England, you know, after Henry the Eighth and all that. Right. There, there were some, to be a priest. Some, there were some allowances for certain families that were known as recusants that were rich enough mm -hmm. to say our estate is staying Catholic and don't mess with us. But right. even but for them, general. it was problematic. And and if you were a priest, so English priests who had been exiled to France would come back over, like St. Edmund Campion is yep. an example of this. They would come back over to minister to the faithful in the underground Catholic Church that yep. was not on the recusant estates and meant to minister to the spiritual needs of the faithful. But because they couldn't just stay on the recusant estates and do that, they needed to travel in situations that would put them in danger, and so families that were sympathetic uh, and who tended to be, you know, would be Catholic themselves because they're taking a huge risk, would have these secret places for priests to hide, and they were called priest holes. And so, if the authorities came by, you get you hustle the priest into the priest hole, and pre and it's behind a bookcase, and you pretend there's no one here, yeah. right? Usually they weren't luxurious. They weren't wings. Of they were, they were closets. They yeah. were you know, yeah. a place where a priest could sit and hide, but there really wasn't much room for anything else. Right. Yeah. And priest holes show up a, quite a number of times in Doctor Who. Uh, yeah. They appear, for example, in the Pyramids of Mars, uh, where yep. the Doctor and Sarah Jane run into another manor that has a priest hole. And they appear other times as well. This is really unusual, though. We have this extensive secret passage system. In Cranley yes. Manor, and the including what was obviously a, a, the bedroom for the priest. Yeah, right. And the doctor says rather large for a priest hole to Lady Cranley later on, and she says, "Yes, the Cranleys of the time were devout and generous, and clergy came from all over to this house, so they right. have an unusually right. large system for mm. of priest holes." Yeah, yeah. It, it would be the American equivalent would be like the Underground Railroad. We that yeah. we had that in, mm -hmm. in here in. And I remember uh, where I lived in Salem, Mass. The house of the famous House of Seven Gables mm -hmm. had a secret uh, passageway in the dining room next to the fireplace that went up a, a staircase into a be an attic bedroom where mm -hmm. um, escaped slaves could stay. So it was a similar right. sort of thing. This, and like you said, this was huge. This is, they say, I guess, yeah. ten bedrooms for this. Uh, now, so and a, a lot unusual. of ho manor houses like this would have had the servants' corridors, where right. the servants could come and go anywhere in the house without bothering the family right you know right. we talked about you know upstairs downstairs and all that where they could get through the house very easily um and they would be maybe not hidden quite so much like this but they definitely would be out of Just sight until discreet. absolutely needed yeah. yeah this this is something i can speak to as a former motel manager uh <laughs> my wife and i managed a mom and pop motel for a while and there are corridors in hotels and motels that the guests know nothing about, but that you <laughs> that you need in order to have access to the plumbing right. and the air conditioning and things like that. You you've got to have access to those things, and so yeah, there are secret passages that people never think about all around. 
Now, now to be fair, though, the most of your typical modern interstate side hotels don't have that. But yeah, the like older, older hotels, the bigger, yeah. fancier ones, they absolutely do. Well, but even, I mean, like even in a just a standard strip motel where you have like a, a two rows of rooms, one on each side, you know, just a little small mom and pop, there's going to be a secret passage down the middle between those two rows of rooms because oh, you yeah. need to yeah. get the plumbers yeah. in there to deal and the electricians to get in there to deal with the plumbing and the electricity and things like that. I yeah. saw that on an episode of X-Files once, I think. Yeah. <laughs> it was, in, in nothing season, good happened. In season 11. <laughs> yeah, nothing good happened in that. Uh, so, the, so the doctor eventually makes his way into this wing where, uh, where George Cranley is, is kept, and he finds the dead servant in a closet. And uh, meanwhile, George Cranley, uh, growling all the time, is wearing the doctor's costume and goes to the party where he grabs either Nissa or Anne, we're not sure at this point, to right. dance. And then wants to take her away, and it turns out this was Anne. Uh, yeah, she goes. Yes, she goes out. willingly. Um, yeah. By the way, I wanted to comment on the party scene. I I like the fancy dress party scene, it, and it is kind of like upstairs downstairs. You have all the upstairs people in the fancy dress, and you've got the servants there in their livery. Mm -hmm. Everyone is enjoying it. Tegan is getting into it. Uh, Nissa is enjoying playing this mystery lady double of Anne. You know, they are Adric one, is eating. Adric is, Adric is, Adric is eating, is eating uh, a lot. He's demolishing the buffet. <laughs> yeah. But it's just, it's just, and, and Tegan is talking to Sir Robert and they're just enjoying each other's company. And it's just a really nice scene. I mean, not a lot is happening plot wise, but it's just pleasant. And I like right. that. Yeah. And like Nissa and Anne are enjoying the fact that no one can tell them apart. At one point, they're doing a dance. Then they duck inside together real quick and come back out. So, like, no one knows which is which. And right. <laughs> um, and then George, as the Harlequin, comes out. He's dancing with Anne. We don't know it's Anne at this point, but uh, he's dancing with one of the insect ladies. And he takes her inside, and she goes willingly, and they're dancing in inside the house because they can and still she hear the music. She thinks it's the doctor. Yeah, she's yeah. well. No, she well, doesn't no, no, know she, who it is. Oh, that's because, right. She doesn't. Right. Yeah, and then a uh, he starts heavy breathing. And he starts to menace her, and a servant comes in, and he and the Harlequin switches his attention to the servant and starts choking him to death. And the butterfly lady faints, and at that point we realize, of course, this is Anne, because never in a million years would Nissa faint. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's right. It became clear right at this point. Uh, yeah, she she screams and faints away uh, because because George kills the the, the footman. Uh, meanwhile, yeah, I, I, I have it. I have in my notes. Uh, Harlequin breathes deeply, grabs in slash Anne, because at this moment I don't know if it's Nissa or Anne, chokes servant, Anne faints. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yes, this is not this is not Nissa. Uh me meanwhile the doctor, still in his robe, uh, runs into Lady Cranley and uh Dittar Latoni, the that's the name of the Amazonian Indian, uh up in the uh, the wing, and he uh as he's trying to get out, and they're trying to figure out where, where George is, because the, the uh the Dittar has noticed that that George is 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 absent from his room. He got loose. Um, and while they're having their conversation, George returns the Harlequin co costume to the doctor's room. So he he's like crazy animal guy, but with enough presence of mind to cover his tracks and put yeah, the costume exactly. back. Uh, so he um, Anne is he took he took Anne away to his room. I think is what what happens here. Yeah. And uh, and pu puts her in his bed, and he and he sort of hovers over her uh, menacingly or or creepily. Let's put it that way. Um, and this is when the 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 footman's body is discovered by uh, Lord Cranley and Sir Robert, and the doctor comes down now in his costume, and Anne shows up and accuses him of of killing the footman because he's in the costume and he's apparently too dumb to. <laughs> To, to cover his tracks yeah. and to pretend that, uh, hey, I, you know, I didn't do anything. What are you talking about? Uh, now, the Lady Cranley knows that the doctor didn't do it because he was with her at the time. Yep. But she had made him promise not to reveal uh, the secret uh, that of, of the... Murdered servant. You know, of the murdered servant. She, she didn't want her guests disturbed as they're having right. a party by this unsightly murder. S but she won't give him his alibi and release him from his promise not to tell the truth 
and he won't e- violate it either. He won't violate that promise to clear his name, which, which is, is very interesting. Which is stupid. Um, I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I don't, I didn't, I didn't necessarily take it as that's why he's not doing this. But yeah, I, that's a valid interpretation. I thought it was just weak writing on their part because the doctor should have said, right. "Come on, you know, Lady Cranley, you know, I was with you two minutes ago in my bathrobe when we found the murdered servant." That right. So obviously, I couldn't have killed this guy. Well, then he goes, he does try to take Sir Robert to, well, first he says, I have no motive. What motive would I have to kill this guy? Uh, you know, I don't have any motive to, 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 to bump off this, this footman. He's like, look, there was already another servant dead. I'll take you to the body. And uh, so he takes Sir Robert there. And of course, Digby's body is gone. He's no, no longer in the, the closet. Um, and it, Lady Cranley continues to play dumb. Yeah, she can, she denies any knowledge of this other murdered person. And I'm thinking, Lady Cranley, this is ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, I understand. Let's not freak everybody out. Let's handle this discreetly. But handling it discreetly is going to involve telling the police. Right. At some point, you gotta, <laughs> you got to do something with the body. you got to tell somebody this guy's dead. Which she eventually does after they've hauled the doctor and companions off. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I, I can only think she's panicking and trying to protect her family, because if if she reveals there's a murdered servant, then they, they're going to investigate. They're going to find that she's got George. Right. That and he's that still George alive. Did yeah. Or, or they decided they needed to get to the doctor and companions with the police to the TARDIS so they can do the scene where the TARDIS is being moved to the manor. The doctor's alibi is or the doctor's situation is rapidly deteriorating because right. he won't tell them his real name. Oh, that's why you've been traveling incognito. And Smutty talks to Lord Cranley on the phone and says that his doctor never left. Right. So it's clearly you're an imposter. Now, again, we have no motive for the doctor here. We have no idea why the doctor and his companions would come at, to kill his servants at the Cranley Manor. But apparently, <laughs> it, it does. Like the, the, that that part doesn't make any sense. I I I felt a little bad for it because that that's that that's a big hole in this plot is. Why do they suspect the doctor, apart from he's well, a stranger? He's a stranger, and he's got a costume, and he is he is kind of secretive. I mean, he's why is he here yeah. if he's... Why was he impersonating this guy that right. Smutty sent if he's not the guy that Smutty sent? And why won't he give right. us his real name? And, and, and they, you know, they think and, he's lying about all that. Yeah. And Yeah. I mean, his opportunity, and there's... A, a, but no motive, but yeah, I see what you're saying. Well, they're, the doctor's arrested, as are the companions as uh, accessories to the crime for some reason, because they happen to be with him. Uh, so they're taken to the police station, but first they, they stop at the train station. As they're leaving, uh, the doctor turns and says, thank you, Lady Cranley, for a totally unexpected afternoon. And it's like, <laughs> oh, burn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, uh, it was a nice, nice uh, posh uh, uh, burn. Uh, they, so they, they stop at the railway station because the doctor wants to show them the TARDIS, but it's been moved. Uh, but then they, they eventually find it at the police station where they, he takes them inside to, to see that it's bigger on the inside. And this is, yeah, how, this how is convenient. actually this is a, cool, though. It is convenient. But it is. It is. No, it is very cool. It's cool because police boxes were introduced in the early 1920s. And so this would have been like the, the police iPhone of the time. <laughs> yeah, and they found one mysteriously on a train station. Maybe a train left it for them to have at Cranley Hall now, and so they naturally they took it back to the police station since they didn't know what else to do with it. But they right. can't get it open. Right, yeah. right. Uh, and so the doctor takes them inside, and they he, they believe him now that he's a time traveler. Because at, w- at one point he says, "Okay, I'll tell you, I'm a time traveler <laughs> from yeah. another planet," and and it was like, "Oh, stop being ridiculous." So so this is. Proves his point. Um, meanwhile, the uh, Detar Latoni, the the uh, the Amazonian Indian with the Italian name, uh, mm, yeah. <laughs> apparently is also really bad at tying knots because George once again gets free of these knots and uh, strangles poor Detar, uh, who, but who manages uh, with his dying breath to hide the key to the door to the room that George is in. Yeah, uh, it's not actually established whether he's dead, but it's open to interpretation either way. Yeah. And then since since Latoni has hidden the key, George starts a fire to <laughs> He breaks uh, the door. Yeah. To, and, and I'm going, he's allowed to have matches? Really? <laughs> <Right>. Exactly. <laughs> um right. yeah. but uh, uh 
But he starts a fire, I thought, with the intent of generating enough smoke to get people to open the door for him. But actually, the plan apparently is to weaken the wood of the door by burning it so he can kick through it. That that is an ill considered plan. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Um, as uh, as Jeeves would say, it, it plan contains too many imponderables. <laughs> right. So now we, there's another part that kind of confuses me, which is like they the Digby's body is found, mm-hmm. and and that, this now exonerates the doctor. And I'm thinking, how? Why does this exonerate the doctor? Like he could have killed Digby. I mean, it's. There is there, we don't have proof that someone else killed him. Well, like, in the wake it, it, in the wake that he was telling the truth about the time traveler thing, I can probably give him the I also didn't kill that guy thing. Yeah, I guess I guess <laughs> true. <laughs> so, um, by, so the, George by the way, is, we get a little more insight into the Cranley family about this time because there's a conversation that occurs between Lord Cranley, Charles, and his mother. And Charles wants to come clean and explain about George, that they've got George in the attic or the priest hole. And Lady Cranley is is opposed to that. She does not want the family secret revealed. And Charles says, but you, we can't let the doctor take the fall for this. He's innocent. And Lady Cranley says, I know the doctor is innocent and he will come to no harm because the case against him is going to fall apart. So right. She's, right. she's not, a, she's, she's acting irresponsibly. I mean, she's putting mm-hmm. family pride and secrecy above the good of others, and it's re- been resulting in deaths. Good, yeah. good sign. You may want to revisit this policy. <laughs> you know, like put this guy in a quiet sanitarium or something somewhere. Mm-hmm. But she, even though she's irresponsible, she's trying. She's still fundamentally a moral person. She's she is not willing to let the doctor ultimately be harmed. But, um, right. She but, is willing to let servants get strangled to death. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's. It, I mean, there's a moral core down there somewhere, but it's got heavy overlay of bad yeah. judgment. Well, oh, but, I, it, but you know, it's 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 a. They're just servants. So, yeah, I mean, gonna, they're yeah. Animal, right? Yeah. <laughs> there's more. There's, we can always get more. I'm just. I keep thinking of that. The big finish episode we talked about, Mastermind. Where, yeah. Not yep. Mastermind. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. Chimes of Midnight. Chimes of Midnight. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. We're, <laughs> this was taken to the extreme. Uh, so. By the way, as the policemen are coming into the TARDIS, you know, they're none of them actually says it's bigger on the inside. Yeah. But they're all clearly agog at the fact. <laughs> and one of them, yeah. uh, when the when Sir Robert calls in this guy he needs to talk to, a guy named Cummings, junior police officer, Cummings comes in and his reaction is, strike me pink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is a good line. I'm going to have to start remembering that one. Uh, so the... Uh, the Cranleys have to explain to Anne what's you know that this is George uh, and Anne obviously uh, unhappy about this. Uh, oh she man! Run- I just imagine my yeah. former fiance has been tragically disfigured and driven insane, and you've been hiding this from me and have been romancing me to marry the younger brother instead. Wow! Am I going to reevaluate some stuff? Yeah, wow, uh, this marriage is still going to happen. I'm still going to be Lady Cranley, but you're going to be <laughs> <Exactly>. sorry. <laughs> so the, the doctor, get, so Robert has to get back to the mansion immediately. So the doctor says, oh, I have something that can help with that. And they take the TARDIS over to the, uh, back to the manor house. And uh, uh, they're all inside. George gets chased down into this entryway where everyone's standing. And George grabs Nyssa, thinking she's Anne, and drags her upstairs through the fire, which... To me, is a very reminiscent of Phantom of the Opera. There's a yeah. very Phantom of the Opera sort mm-hmm. of uh, vibe going on at this point. Um, I, I love late- what happens next, where the Doctor, with Charles and Adric, race upstairs to rescue Nyssa, and then immediately race back down, explaining that the stairs are on fire. So you just <laughs> let the crazy madman take Nyssa up through there anyway, and just turned around? <laughs> and then the, the Doctor runs outside... To look uh-huh. up for for reasons to look up at the roof, somehow having deduced that's where George is going to take Nyssa, and so he, he runs out there to re- saying he's going to rescue Nyssa by running outside and looking helplessly up at the roof. Then he tells everyone who's rushed out after him to distract George up on the roof while he finds a way up through the house. And it's like, this would have been so much simpler if you just ran up those stairs and ignored the flames. <laughs> right, exactly. right. Run through the flames, just like George and Nissa just did. 
so we have a, an explanation by Lady Cranley about the black orchid that it was uh, sacred to an Amazonian tribe who, uh, when George harvested it, they cut out his tongue and disfigured him, which broke his mind. Um, and then a different tribe's chieftain, who was de Tarlatoni, took pity on him and brought him home to care for him. Uh, so we we get we get the backstory. Now we know what happened to George. And, and um, this makes me think a little less of Latoni because, wait, you were the chief of a tribe. You had the care of a people and you ditched them to go to England to be with this rich family and take care of their crazy son. <laughs> this is not really fulfilling your chiefly responsibilities there, dude. Well, maybe maybe hospitality to strangers is extreme <laughs> in their culture yeah. or something. I don't know. Let's see we could go there. Or maybe he just wanted a vacation. Uh, <laughs> I retire. I'm going to England. I, well, uh, so, I mean, I understand the I'm sick of the jungle. I want to go to the land where it's overcast all the time and I don't speak the language very well and no, everyone will alienate me. And But OK. Lots of books. He apparently <laughs> likes to read books. He likes, because likes there were books. Lo- there, yeah. There were lots yep. of books there. So uh, Charles cl- uh, scales the exterior of the manor house to get to the roof where George has Nyssa. Uh, uh, I, I'm guessing that Charles has done this before as a younger man uh, in and out of the house. <laughs> he knows how to sneak out. <laughs> yeah, he knows how to sneak out. And uh, so uh, we have this. So Charles is up there with and then the doctor comes up from behind him and Charles and George is all you know, surrounded um, with Nissa. And they can, they convince him to give up Nissa that she's not really Anne. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then and Charles then goes this... to hug George and he falls over backwards off the roof and dies. Yeah. George recoils yep. from his brother mm-hmm. and falls off the roof. Like what a way to go, Charles. Yep. Good job. <laughs> Saving and, your and brother. Course, I was going to say, and of course you hear the, uh, the stereotypical. Yeah. The, <laughs> the, you know. the meat slapper paddles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not, not like a, not like a pumpkin hitting the pavement, but, uh, so, uh, so we have a pretty yeah. downer ending at this point. Yeah, mm-hmm. it is. And, uh, we we cut to later, and apparently they've they've stuck around. The doctor and, fr- and friends have stuck around for a bit. Um, they've stayed for the funeral, and uh, Tegan is has been given um, a box of their costumes from the ball as a gift, which is which we will gone. never see again. <laughs> and then uh, I wonder if they hang ever hang them in like in New Who the scenes where the doctor is trying out his new costume or whatever. If they're actually hanging in the background, I wonder if someone that should, would be cool. someone should go back and check those. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, Lady Cranley gives the Doctor a copy of George Cranley's book called Black Orchid, published when, by Castle and Castle. When did he write this book? Was it before he harvested the black orchid and got disfigured, or was it after he harvested the black orchid and got disfigured? Because if it was before, how would he have the information to write the book? And it was if it was after, then it, writing a book afterwards would kind of reveal the fact you're not dead. Well, also, uh, it, the, it, it, the afterward was when he was crazy. So Yeah, although I could right. say maybe he went crazy slowly, but <laughs> okay. still, or, this is or problematic. The book is, or a book, the book is like the king in yellow. <laughs> it yeah. drives you insane to read it. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe not. And that's and that's where we end. Uh, the doctor, thank you. I shall treasure the book. And then he throws yeah. it in some back room in the TARDIS. So this is their "I feel young" moment at the end of Wrath of Khan to lighten the otherwise <laughs> horrifically downer ending. <laughs> right, um, right. But it doesn't succeed as well as the "I feel young" moment. So it's still kind of a downer ending. It's a strange um, ending. Like the, you don't have to end it with George tumbling off the roof. I mean, there are other ways they could have ended this. Mm-hmm. You know, they could have ended with him being taken away to a sanitarium for yeah. his own good, etc. Yeah. Um, it. it yeah, I kind of weird. I find it interesting. So, like, what does all this say about the Cranley family? Because we're meant to be sympathetic to them, and I think at heart they are good people. Mm-hmm. But wow, um, <laughs> there's a lot of dysfunction going on family-wise here, oh, yeah. right? And I, I'm not entirely sure what to think about them. Um, the one, I mean, Lady Cranley makes some really bad decisions, and George, is, even though he's he's he is heroic, and you know he climbs the building to save Nissa, who's not his fiance, you know, but he's mm-hmm. climbing up there to help her to confront his crazy brother. But even he is like. Okay, you've been keeping the secret that your brother's alive from his fiance while you woo her instead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is uh, 
I mean, maybe he felt an obligation to her. Like they, don't guilt. Have, they don't have love or right marriage in England, and they weren't married anyway. <laughs> no, but like, the, like the guilt of my my brother is you know is un- incapable of marrying you. You're devastated, um, and so I'm I I feel this you know th- this obligation to you, and that develops into feelings. Maybe yeah. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Also, we you know we have the the fact that the servant. Uh, People are utterly unconcerned about, I mean, not utterly, but they're too unconcerned about, they're not Mm -hmm. concerned enough about the fact that servants are being murdered. And part of it I know is the time and part of it is the genre of the cozy mystery. Like when the, even when the doctor comes to tell Lady Cranley that a servant has been murdered, he doesn't come in and say, a servant has been murdered. He, He comes in and says, I've discovered something rather unpleasant. (laughs) <laughs> and and then when yeah. when Lady Cranley sees the murdered servant in the cupboard, she's like, "Oh, Doctor, I must apologize to you for this unpleasantness." <laughs> and it's like we're <laughs> being so over civilized and over classy here, right? You can acknowledge the horror of this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I have to point out at this point that that uh, Peter Davison and uh, Matthew Waterhouse and um, uh, Tegan, none of them liked the this script. They mm-hmm. they all thought it was pretty oh. weak and that there wasn't really much mystery. Which, we, as we acknowledged, like we we kind of figured it was George right, as soon as we heard about poor yeah. poor George who died with the Black Orchid. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas Sarah Sutton, who plays Nissa, enjoyed it more, of course, because she got the fun of being two characters. Yeah, um, right. Not uh, so that, not the only time in Doctor Who history that has happened. Right, right, right. <laughs> So uh, I could see where they, they that I, it, the, as what I saw, they, they thought that the, it was filled with Edwardian stereotypes, which yeah. it sort of was. It was. And, <laughs> and, 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 it, and yeah, it lacked a, a, some mystery to it, I guess. But I, I, I still enjoyed it. I still yeah. liked this one. Um, oh, yeah, it's a fun one. There were, there, were, there were good elements in it. Yeah, it was fun. I liked how um, when Lady Cranley asks Nissa where she's from, the Empire of Trocken. Yes, and she's yeah. like, is, "Oh," and just kind of lets that pass because yeah. it's an empire. Is that over by Escher? She, she's never heard of. But then later, yep. when uh, Niss is talking to Anne, and she says she's from Trocken. Oh, is that near Escher? And that's yes. like a town in in Surrey in southeast England. <laughs> right, right. Oh, and she says no, and she's like, "Oh, yeah, nothing good comes from there anyway." So that's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that that and they they insist that she must be of the Worcestershire Talbots. Uh, so because <laughs> she looks so much like Anne. <laughs> Uh, but nope. Uh, so the, yeah. So uh, any last thoughts on this episode? Any uh, last bits, Father? Car- Car- well, I was I was proud of the BBC. They actually moved up in their casting of Amazonian Indians instead of you know some in- English guy dressing up. The name of the actor is Ahmed Khalil. So, <laughs> so it's somebody who's uh, you know of a you know uh, at least Middle a- Eastern or yeah. some descent like that, where it's not just a regular white guy. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Although they had to dub his lines because he couldn't speak effectively with the lip plate, which is interesting because in cultures that use lip plates, uh, they're often associated with orator with fine oratory and singing. Hmm. So I guess if you grow up with it and your lip naturally grows around the lip plate, you can actually speak and sing quite well. But this thing cosmetic thing they did for the actor who obviously didn't have a, a lip plate in real life right may right. i uh, that's my understanding anyway he did have yeah. trouble speaking so well, they imagine had to trying to do imagine trying to speak when you get your lip is stuck out like you know way out <laughs> well, there yeah my guess is is I, he it was just something that he was holding in his mouth mm-hmm. sort of like just mm. that wasn't like it you know, obviously it wasn't his real lip but right uh but it was it was yeah. It was just something that was like his. He was holding with his teeth, which would maybe yeah make him more mumbly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, lip plates in some cultures are associated with manhood in uh, in mm. South America. It, as mm. a, as a kid, you're raised in quote unquote the women's world, and then when you leave, and so you're like housed in the in the house with the women, where all the women sleep together. And or you're otherwise raised by women, and then as you as you reach the point of manhood, you leave that and join the world of men, and that's when you get your lip plate. So it's like a rite of passage, ah. signifying manhood. And it would if that if he's if Latoni is from a tribe like that, you know that would be part of his mm-hmm. 
social right. status, an indicator of his social status, because uh, chiefs tended to have the biggest lip plates. <laughs> of course. There you go. All right. So that's uh, Black Orchid. And uh, so that's what we had to say. We'd love to hear what you think about it. Uh, Before we finish, we do want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Doctor Who, including Bennett G, Tara H, Francis B, Carla K, and Jason K. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Doctor Who and all the shows at StarQuest, and you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Uh, we'd also like to thank Victor Lambs, who edits our show every week. Uh, so that's it from us. What did you think of Black Orchid, well, this Fifth Doctor story? You can let us know by commenting at sqpn.com slash Doctor Who, or the Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page, or by sending an email to Who at sqpn.com. And we'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the 10th Doctor story called The Next Doctor. It's a Christmas episode. Uh, I like that one. Yes, that's a good one. So until then, Father Corey Stika, thank you for joining me in sharing The Secrets of Doctor Who. Well, thank you, Dom. And Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who on StarQuest. And remember, what do you do with a cocktail in a bath? Why drink it, old boy? Right. This is going to be fun. That was one of my favorite lines there. <laughs>